Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. I'll never forget the first time I met Daisy Bicking. In January 2015, I went to a seminar of Daisy's to learn as much as I could about pathology in the foot. She did a great PowerPoint presentation and I was struck by how easily she communicated about the different issues that we see with horses. She even had bones of various degrees of bone loss in terms of the coffin bone and navicular bone. And we were able to handle these bones and feel these pathological changes for ourselves. It really made me want to pursue as many ways as possible to help horses in need. So why don't we start and say your name and how you're involved in hoof care. So my name is Daisy Bicking and I am a farrier, hoof care provider. The title doesn't really matter to me. We all just take care of horses' feet. And I work full-time in the field as well as have the Daisy Haven Farm um, Rehabilitation Center. So we take horses here on site for rehab. And I also teach through the School of Integrative Healthcare, um, workshops, classes, um, one-on-ones, mentorships, you name it. I just like talking hoof and sharing information. <laughs> so you're super busy. <laughs> Well, yes, I do have my hand in a number of different pots, so to speak, but um, all all hoof and horse related, and it's all a passion, so it doesn't feel like work. Yeah, that's great. So uh, can you tell us about how you got started in hoof care? Well, yeah, like a lot of us um, these days, you know, I had a horse who had feet that fell apart. My horse foundered in 2004. And um, fortunately, I had a wonderful farrier who could help me. And she put the rasp in my hand and said, hey, I can I can teach you to, you know, help me take care of your horse's feet, but not on this one. So she taught me to uh, trim on my non-foundered horse while she took care of my foundered horse. But she also encouraged me to go learn everything that I could possibly learn about the horse's foot. So I'm grateful to her because not only did she support me and get me started and give me confidence, but she also said, go learn from everybody you can learn from. And so I just started reading online and taking clinics and really um, to initially help my own horses and then realize that everybody else had a horse like mine. And none of us at the time in 2004, we really didn't know what to do with them. We knew that they had metabolic problems, but we didn't have the information we have access to now. And I learned, I was really passionate about helping other people because I knew how lost I had felt and I wanted to help other horses with those similar problems. And did you start off mainly trimming in the beginning or like when did you get into the glue on and composite world? Yeah. So, you know, I started out as a diehard, crazy barefooter and I believed that every horse should be barefoot and I believe they all could be barefoot because, you know, back then we didn't really necessarily know any different. We had high hopes for every horse. And um, while my horse improved immensely barefoot, I quickly figured out that I could only keep him basically pasture sound or light riding sound with being barefoot. And if I wanted to take him to any competitions, you know, after he healed from his laminitis, um, the, the footing that was at the showgrounds was not necessarily uh, supportive to a barefoot horse and my horse would get foot sore. And competing in dressage, um, you know, he needed to feel freely forward. He needed to be, you know, you know, have good quality of gates, all those things we're looking for. And if he was foot tender on the rocks in between the rings, it wasn't going to promote a, you know, quality uh, performance by me and my horse or let alone prevent him from having further problems. So started researching other ideas and was actually pointed at uh, some of the early glue-on shoes. Um, at the time, it was predominantly the opponent shoe. And went out and spent time with them, and they taught me to glue. And I thought, well, this is very barefoot friendly. 
I tried all the tricks. I tried booting my horse in between the rings. I tried, you know, uh, conditioning him more, you know, walking on different surfaces, exposing him to different things. And it was just very, very frustrating. So the glue on shoes to me were a good compromise at the time for my ideals. And then I realized actually for him in his situation, how much better he was and more consistent the performance we had with some kind of protection more than boots and so um decided to have that as a tool in my toolbox uh for my clients as well you know and really you know all those all those tools came from studying with lameness experts as much as i possibly could like i learned a lot from elpo the equine lameness prevention organization they have a phenomenal educational program focusing on identifying lameness, how to look at movement, how to look at um, mechanics in your trim or in your shoe to help horses. Um, they do you know, leverage testing and looking at where we can mechanically make things easier for the horse, which is often really helpful. And then Dr. Judith Shoemaker has been my primary mentor and she had me really opened my eyes to the impact of my method and approach to the foot and how that impacted the whole horse with the postural component, wanting the horse to stand square as opposed to under themselves and looking at the balance of the foot and how that creates compensatory issues in the horse's body. If I don't do my job well of addressing the balance of the foot. And so it gave me a very clear hierarchy of what are my goals as a starting point for every horse and every foot. Right. And when you're talking about the postural rehabilitation, um, is that in terms of, you know, obviously they're staying square and that's where you're saying that a lot of the healing is happening in terms of their posture. Well, it's interesting. If you, if you ask 10 hoof care providers what their goal is with, their work, the trim or protective device, whatever, a lot of times they say, well, I want to balance the foot. Well, what is that? What is balance? What are we balancing to? Soul plane, are we balancing to the coffin bone? Are we balancing to posture? So for me, if somebody says to me, what's your goal with your work? My goal is to help the horse compensate for the wear and tear of domestication with the least amount of breakdown and injury possible over their lifetime. So that comes from Dr. Shoemaker. And she taught me that when horses stand square in, in rest, right? Not when they're moving or grazing, what have you, but if their default posture is square, then they have equal load into each limb and the least compensation in their body from just standing around, which horses do a lot. If we're honest with ourselves, most of our horses don't move as much as they maybe should, or we would like them to, but when they're standing, that's their predominant input into their system. So if horses are always standing with one hip cocked or they're standing out over their front toes or leaning a little left or a little right, over time, that's gonna create compensations. And what we do with the horse's feet is critical to helping promote the least amount of asymmetrical use for that animal possible. That's really interesting. It's you know something that I would like to learn more about, especially hoping to go to your your class soon. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about that in the classes because the, the reason why we talk about posture and the way that I look at the foot in the class is so that we all have a common ground because people coming to the class come from all different backgrounds. They might be traditionally trained. They might be barefoot trained. Some might be from, um, say a short toe philosophy. Some might have ideas about balance that are, per, that are specific to the way they were taught. And so what I do is I bring up kind of where I've come to, not to say that everybody should trim or look at the foot that way, but just so that we all have 
a common language and a common understanding because otherwise if I come out and say something and you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's hard to learn in that kind of environment. Right. So we do go through the way that I look at balance, the way that I look at the foot, the whole horse and where those ideas come from as an, as a way of developing some commonality amongst us to go forward with. And I know you mentioned the Epona shoes, but what are some of the other materials that you work with often? Well, there's a lot of great composite shoes on the market now. I mean, we're very fortunate that these alternative materials have uh, the market's grown, the demand has grown. And so now the demand has has created more options for us. Um, so, you know, there's there's all versions of, of composites at this point, you know, from peripheral loaded composites to cuffs to aluminum shoes that are coated in composite materials to full uh, frog support shoes, wide web shoes, almost anything you can think of, clogs, wooden shoes, anything you can think of is now available. So for me, I tend to gravitate a lot towards things with frog support and sole support and predominantly easy care products at this point. But there's, you know, really a myriad of choices if you have a problem you're trying to solve. And I was really fortunate, and thank you so much for letting me uh, ride along with you last week and got to see you do some gluing. Um, oh, yeah, that was really fun. Yeah, it was great. Uh, and it's just beautiful. I mean, you're saying that you have some experience with sculpture, and I could totally see that in your work. It's very <laughs> art, thank you. like an art form. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your favorite gluing method? I know I saw you do kind of a combination of direct glue and indirect gluing. Yeah, so most of the work I do is therapeutic, some kind of rehabilitative, although most of my horses go back to work of some degree, and a lot of times we just adjust the shoe package that we apply. But my favorite glue application is with an acrylic glue like Equilox or Equibond or Easy Shoe Bond. It comes in a slow and a fast set. Um, Honestly, at this point, the fast set, the glue really doesn't go that fast, especially if you compare it to other glues on the market, like your urethanes. But the acrylic glues, they have, you know, the fast sets tend to have like a two minute uh, set time, two to seven minutes, it says. It depends on the ambient temperature, but it allows me to let that glue set up enough that I can actually build three-dimensionally on a direct glue application, which means on the sole side, gluing to the sole and building vertical height for thin-soled horses. I can build wedging, whether it's uh, a heel wedge, a toe wedge, medial lateral. So I can really adjust my balance three-dimensionally with that initial glue application. And then I like to put um, antimicrobials underneath. Usually Artemud is my protectant of choice and also dental impression material. And then I glue around that to give sole support and frog support to create that balance and mechanics. My name is Tara Bortels and I am a trimmer here in Michigan. I have been to a few of Daisy's courses and I cannot say enough wonderful things about her, not only as a mentor, because she is incredibly intelligent and innovative and she documents everything. Um, She's just this wealth of information, but I also admire her on other levels too. She's a wife, she's a mom, and I'm just really inspired by all the things that she tackles from her, her marathons to the horse stuff and everything in between. So do you have a favorite kind of case to work on? Well, I'll take anything that's rehabilitative. I I will do performance horses, but honestly, my passion is fixing the train wrecks and helping them. So most of the horses I work on, certainly the laminitics are probably the predominance of the work that I do. Um, And also a lot of arthritic horses, the caudal heel pain horses, navicular type, uh, ring bone, and any of the itis horses, I call them, you know, to me, our, our laminitics have mainly front of the foot problems and our caudal heel pain horses, our arthritic horses have back of the foot problems. So, you know, those are the two areas that I spent, tend to spend most of my time in my work. And did you have a case or, you know, a horse that 
really surprised you in terms of recovery? Like you thought that it was going to be a lost cause and you were able to rehabilitate something you didn't think you could? That's really a great question. You know, one of the things that that I get told a lot, surprisingly, by clients when they call me initially is that their horse is basically going to be euthanized unless I can help them. And I always laugh to myself and think, gee, that's no pressure. You know, like if you don't help my horse, my horse is dying, <laughs> right? It's, it's an incredible place to live in. But most of the horses, if the owners come to me, these horses are pretty sick. They're pretty broken down. They've often tried everything else. And the, the interesting thing about the, the niche per se that I seem to fill in the hoof care world is that I'm both a barefooter and a shoer. And so um, I get I get people who really want their horses barefoot, but then find they can't. And they sort of come to me and they say, okay, like I, I've been trying all these things and it's not working. So you feel like you might have some other ideas, but you're still comfortable because of your barefoot background. And then I also get people that come to me and say, well, you know, like we've tried all the traditional routes and it's not really working for my horse and you have some different ideas. And so we kind of come to the same place where each group of people have exhausted these ideas of, of what's readily available. And when they come to me, they're really desperate. So to answer your question about, you know, am I surprised Do I get a case that I'm surprised that they do well? Well, those are all the cases to me. However, that being said, it's taught me to have high expectations for every horse. And I've worked really hard and I've studied and I've, I've learned from as many different people as I can. So I have as many tricks in my toolbox to help all these different crazy cases that I get to work on. And so I'm pretty well prepared for bizarre stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah. And is there a case that, like a specific case you can think of that you found really interesting? Oh, gosh. Well, let's see. So I don't have a specific case in mind, but I, I mean, I can, I can describe any number of cases that um, all have their challenges. I'm trying to think, Alicia, my goodness. One case in particular was a case that had been at a university hospital and had had several intensive interventions done, like she'd had tenotomies on both front feet. She was a, a laminated horse. It wasn't very clear if she was truly metabolic because she was very borderline in her diagnosis in the blood work and things like that. So she was conservatively being treated like metabolic. She'd been given some steroids to, to prepare for breeding. So it was kind of like they weren't sure what the incidenting cause was at the time of her laminitis. And so she had crashed pretty hard and gone to the university and um, they had uh, done tenotomies and they really had given her a 10% chance of survival and the owner wasn't ready to give up. So she brought her home and she actually was looking for Paige Poss mm -hmm. and then got my name because Paige had moved out of the area. You know, she had moved out of the East Coast area. And so she called me and I ended up taking the horse here at, at the rehabilitation center. And we worked on her. She was sloughing her left front hoof capsule and had massive infections in both front feet. Her right front, she had caudally rotated after the tenotomy. So her coffin bone plane was um, too low in the heel. And she actually had an infection in the medial pulmonary process, which was um, very difficult to resolve. And so I just had high expectations. Her mental place was excellent. She was upright. She was not as lame as you would expect her to be, given the severity of her damage to her feet. And she was a really challenging case. We spent probably two to three hours with her every day for four months wow. between maggot debridement therapy, clean tracks, soaking, um, honestly trimming and debriding her feet. She did eventually lose two thirds of the left front capsule, but her coffin bone had keratinized. And I felt that because she had a frog corium that was keratinized and the bottom of the coffin bone that she could stand on that. 
and we of course had her in padded boots and we had her in leg wraps and she was in a um a paddock where she could choose to go lay down in a deeply bedded run-in stall matted area or she could come out and walk around as she chose so she had movement uh, and she actually did really really well and ended up going home four months later fairly sound which was amazing she had regrown an immense amount of foot and um, we ended up putting glue on shoes on her before we sent her home and um, she's she's really she did phenomenally that's amazing she was quite a challenging case but we all just had high hopes it was like if she was mentally in it and participating and willing to try then we were happy to help her and because of i think her attitude and i really think that's what it comes down to with those challenging cases is is the horse an active participant in the healing process because you can give them all the tools you can offer them an opportunity to get better but if they've given up it's it's not going to matter right you know so that's about her really that's about her resiliency and her emotional wherewithal to say yeah you know i'm a tough cookie and sure my feet aren't great at the moment but i can see we're heading in a direction and you guys are working hard to help me and i'm gonna I'm going to participate and and keep my head in the game. If she had checked out at any given time and said, uncle, and said, this is too much, I can't do this, we would have said, okay. It would have been okay to let her go. But it ended up working out really well. But I give her a lot of credit for that. <laughs> yeah. My name is Claire Chipman. I am a health care provider in Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And I go to work alongside with Daisy Bicking with glue on work and regular trims and work on case studies. I have known Daisy coming up to two years now and I've been going to a lot of her clinics as well as the Huff Summit. The best thing about these clinics are you have a group of many different backgrounds of people who attend, whether they're owners, barriers themselves, their foot trimmers, vets, dentists. It's a very open and open-minded group to come to. You really get to have a lot of time to be hands-on, as well as the educational part. So you can start seeing what she does on a day-to-day -day basis and how it would be applied to what you could even bring home. She makes you feel part of a team with her and you're going through it together. Because I was able to attend the Hoof Summit with Daisy at her booth, I was able to see other like-minded people and new people that wanted to experience this journey and how we can all learn more from it and get together. And so, you know, amidst helping all these horses and traveling to different clients and having the rehab horses at your home, at what point did you end up starting your school? So, yeah, so that's a really, that's a really good question. I actually started teaching because I was fortunate enough to acquire my own digital radiograph machine which is legal in Pennsylvania and the vets around me support. I follow the state guidelines and have it safety inspected and have to follow all the regulations that everybody else who uses um, radiology has to follow. But it was such a valuable tool for me in working on some of these cases that I wanted to share that with other people. So I started teaching in 2009 when really I'd only been doing this myself full time for four years. And so I didn't really feel qualified to teach at that point. What I felt I was passionate to do was to share the benefit of that x-ray machine with other people who didn't have access to it. And back then, digital x-ray was not as common or prevalent. The vets didn't have the machines in a lot of areas. And so farriers and health care providers, we didn't have access to as many digital x-rays, let alone progressive images. So the, the benefit of having that x-ray machine is I can take radiographs before I work on a horse, after I trim, and then trim again and take another radiograph, and then put a protective device on if I want and take another radiograph and then adjust that, that shoe or whatever I put on the horse. So it's basically like having a fancy measurement device where I can get objective feedback about the effectiveness of my work in a moment. 
We're not using it to diagnose. The diagnoses on these horses have already been done. We're just looking to make sure that we're being accurate in what we think we're achieving. And what I found when I got it for myself and I was just using it for myself is that I couldn't believe how often I really wasn't doing what I thought I was doing. It was so humbling, Alicia. It was actually horrifying at times where I'd be like, oh, pat myself on the back. Oh, I gave this whiz bang trim on this horse. And then I'd radiograph it and I found out that I didn't really do what I thought I had done. And I'd have to scratch my head and say, how am I miss this? How am I, how am I misreading the foot? Where did I go awry? And how do I, how do I adjust it? And trust me, there are plenty of times I pulled off glue on shoes and said, that's just not going to work and had to start over because once I radiographed it, I didn't know what I didn't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I wanted to share that, that objective feedback with other practitioners. So I started hosting clinics and workshops just so we could take a whole bunch of cadaver legs, radiograph them. And I, and I wouldn't tell anybody what these radiographs looked like. And then everybody can apply whatever trim, assess the foot. We go through a process, but trim style is up to them. I wanted them to be able to test drive what they were doing at home. And then we'll re-radiograph the legs and compare the before radiograph. Did they assess the foot accurately? Did they, uh, you know, where's P3? What's the balance? And then the balance they put on with the trim did they achieve what they were hoping to achieve? And it's a phenomenal way just to get objective feedback about the effectiveness of your work. And then from there, I realized that I had some things I had learned from taking all those radiographs so much. And we certainly don't radiograph every horse we work on. And we certainly don't radiograph every horse every time. But certain horses, absolutely. So I have a database of over 500,000 hoof pictures with corresponding radiographs. They're all scaled and measurable. And from that database, I realized there were a lot of common things that we weren't correlating in our educational world. And so that's when I actually started the school and started teaching a formal endorsement program and then doing mentorships and apprenticeships as well. And so, and I want to include a link to, um, I'll include that in the description to, I know that you have some upcoming classes. Um, yeah. But what do your different classes focus on? I know you have different levels that go through uh, your course. Right. So anybody can come take a course. Like I, you know, I don't, I don't care if you're just beginning or if you've been in the industry for 30 years, 50 years, it doesn't matter to me. We're all getting together just to learn and look at feet and talk about pathology and common problems. So anybody can come to a class. You know, looking at the courses that we offer, in my mind, I originally designed the workshops to be continuing professional development, even though we have all different sorts of people attending the courses, beginners and advanced practitioners alike. So when I thought about my own work, it always seemed like I have, you know, 80% of my horses that I feel really strongly about, like that I've got them well managed, they're responding well to the treatment plan, they're, you know, just moving forward in the direction that I think they should be going easily. Yet I have 20% of my horses that just aren't as responsive or I struggle with a little bit more or I'm always searching for other answers. So. I tend to reach out to mentors or to other practitioners or talk to the veterinarian involved in the case about what else we could be doing or what am I missing that I could offer this horse to help them even more. And in talking to other farriers and healthcare providers, I found everybody kind of feels similarly that for the most part, we feel confident about what we're doing, but there's a portion of our horses that we just wish we had more tools in our toolbox for. And that's what, to me, the workshops we offer are designed for, is that 20% of horses that we all wish we just had a few more tools in our toolbox or could understand a little better what we're missing to help them even more. Not to reinvent everything you're doing, because I think most of us are doing a really good job for most of our horses, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and then at the courses, the way we do that is uh, the five day courses are like our our foundation course and it's designed that the first three days are a little bit of lecture and theory and anatomy and some case studies so we're all kind of talking the same language um, and going over radiographs how to read radiographs as a farrier how to use radiographs in your practice and what they can do for you in giving you clues about what you might do to help that horse specifically because it's amazing to me how many healthcare providers are never offered the opportunity or don't have training in how to read a radiograph when it's given to them for shoeing or trimming purposes so we do a lot of that on the first day and then the next two days is practicing looking at radiographs the first day is with cadavers so we radiograph all the cadavers ahead of time and everybody gets together and we split the groups into um, slow and fast groups as opposed to advanced and beginner groups. So that way, if you want to take your time, go over tool use, go over mapping the foot per chance, if you want to look into more of that, if you want to um, really break down the distortions of the hoof, we talk a lot about how the external hoof distorts in relation to the internal physical anatomy so that you're not going to have a radiograph for every foot but you can be as close as possible at having x-ray vision every time because those distortions are repeatable so we look at all that on the cadavers if you want to be in the slower group then we go slowly and we break things down very very meticulously into steps and processes and even as basic as how to use your tools the fast group are people who feel like they have a good handle on mapping and they can use their tools or they just want to kind of go through their motions. They just want to do their thing. Any choice is okay. And we um, work as teams. We work on feet individually, but we look at each other's and we compare. Then when everybody's done, we re-radiograph those cadaver legs and we spend the last part of the afternoon reviewing what everybody got done what their before radiograph looked like did they assess their foot accurately what what their plan was with the foot and then what they actually got in the end was it what they wanted was it what they anticipated so we can all learn from looking at each other's feet and our each other's thought processes so it's quite a powerful method of objective feedback about your work and it's very individual to what each person wants to do. If you want to try something that I demonstrate or I talked about, I'm glad to work with people on that. On the other hand, if you just want to do your thing, you know, do your trim, what have you, you're welcome to do that as well. Yeah, this all sounds really fun. I can't wait to go. <laughs> yeah, we have a blast with it. And then the last day of the of the first three days is live horses. We take all that. We go to a local rescue that has all sorts of different kind of hoof problems. We go to this rescue and we we all team up so we can work on getting under horses for the for the people who are more beginner at trimming. And then the advanced people, I give them, match them with horses that are things they specifically want to work on. I want to work on a low heeled horse. I want to work on a foundered horse. I want to work on a ring bone horse. They have every single problem imaginable at this rescue. And so, um, and they're not horses that I normally work on. So they've got a variety of trim styles on the horses and we can all just get in there and they're grateful we come and we apply these ideas to that rescue group. So that's really fun too. That's great. And then the last two days of a five day workshop are the glue days. And that's the other thing that we offer that's uh, sort of unique to what you can learn in a lot of um, you know, weekend courses or even farrier schools, they're not necessarily going to talk a lot about glue or let you do hands on. So I do a demo day first where I give a glue lecture. We talk about all the different glue on shoes, all the different glues, how they behave, talk about why I've chosen the ones I work with, but I'm happy for people to use what they like. And I'll help them because I'm well versed in all of them. And then um, in the afternoon, I do a demonstration. So we pick a live horse and you can see the process start to finish of how do you manage working on horses with glue on shoes in your daily work? Because that's really complicated. It's one thing to glue the darn thing on a cadaver. It's another thing to have to work with a live horse, right? And manage the live horse. Yeah. So the demo is nice because it shows everybody my workflow and how I set up my gear, how I set up my table, what tools I like to use. Just gives some people some real day practical application of, of the workflow. Yeah, definitely. And then, 
It's fabulous. We have a great time. And I always pick something interesting. And I have x-rays on everything and case studies on everything. So you get a really in-depth case study of a horse that I'm using glue-ons with. And then the last day is all hands-on for participants. So we pull out those cadavers that we've trimmed. We modify the trims for shoeing, if needed, and talk about the ins and outs of that. And then we pick shoe sizes, and then we all glue one at a time. And the benefit of that is that everybody gets to watch each other's practices and mistakes. And I guarantee you that the person who goes last on glue day is more proficient than the person who went first because they've watched everybody else go. And you learn through that process really well. Mm. And we all talk about what you did well and where you could have done something a little differently or would your shoe stay on long term? And, um, you know, for a full shoeing cycle. So it's really, really neat when we all kind of line up in a row. Everybody's got their cadaver legs that's been prepped. You've got your shoe ready. We use Play-Doh instead of dental impression material if you want to fill the foot or not. And we just run right through all this glue work. And so it's a lot of repetition all at one time. That's great. Yeah. I can't wait to do that. That's probably what I'm most excited about. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited to do it with you too. Yeah. Yeah. So the other kind of course that we offer for CPD is um, the advanced pathology workshop. And that's not hands-on at all. That's actually where I have a full day of lecture the first day. It's a three-day course. The next two days, one is dedicated to those itises, as I call it, of the front of the foot, like your laminitis, your club feet, your toe cracks, anything that affects the front of the foot. The second day is everything, the itises of the back of the foot. So um, articular ring bone, non-articular ring bone, you know, side bone concerns, navicular, caudal heel pain concerns. Um, And we throw in a bunch of unusual things um, like quitter, canker. We talk about foals and doing limb corrections, um, angular limb deformity on foals, how we can help those horses with some glue on techniques. And then I do demonstrations. We do leverage testing. We talk about all sorts of things that can help your toolbox with those advanced pathology cases. And that's the advanced course? That's the advanced course, yeah. yeah. So we so we offer both twice a year at our facility in Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, the, the um, more basic level one, as we call it, uh, foundation course is the five day, and then the advanced course, which we would consider loosely a level two course, but again, they're open to everyone. So anyone can take them at any time, whether you're enrolled in an endorsement program or not. Yeah, it's great. I like that idea. I I like that it's flexible and that you accommodate whoever shows up. And it sounds like it's really, you know, it's almost a community building experience. It really is. I mean, everybody that comes is by nature open-minded and open to learning because they're at my course, right? right? So we don't end up with people at the courses who are like, um, single-minded and elitist, it just doesn't really happen. So everyone who comes is open to learning from each other. I love that it's a place that all people of all different kinds of backgrounds can come together and have honest conversations about the pros and cons of different approaches and the time and place for them during the course, because that's so valuable. We can all learn from each other. And that's important to me that we have an environment that supports that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And were you saying that you had some other school that you were starting or looking into starting? I know you had mentioned something about that before. So this is something that we're really excited to offer. Um, it's, it's a very limited offering at the moment because we're planning on expanding the program. But we're offering a immersive 8 to 12 week hoof care farrier school program, which involves classroom time as well as riding along with me for an extended period of time. So originally our courses were offered as continuing professional development. And hence the workshops are three days on the weekend, five days on the weekend, things like that. And it's never enough time. And I've been asked many times, would I consider offering an immersive eight week or 12 week program for someone that has the flexibility in their schedule to devote that much time and attention to their education. 
And I also get a number of inquiries about whether somebody can come to me for school. And so we've recently decided to go ahead with that program. There's been a lot of interest and I can only accommodate uh, three students at a time, but we have made housing arrangements. We've made arrangements for curriculum and it's all in the process of being finalized and will be published with the new year. So if someone's interested in that kind of immersive experience, it's gonna be basic all the way to advanced. It can be tailored to students and will be focused on uh, radiographs, trimming, and glue and composite shoes. That's really exciting. Yeah, we're That's super really excited. Cool. There's really nothing like it. And when enough people come to you and say, you know, would you do this? Would you accommodate this? Can I ride with you? We've actually had a number of students come for extended periods so far, and it's been wonderful, and the feedback's been amazing. So I think we're just going to have to bite the bullet and say, okay, let's do this. And so do you have any closing tips or advice for owners or hoof care providers that are really interested in their horse's soundness? Oh gosh. You know, I think I think the beauty of our of our modern world is the accessibility of information. And the best thing that a horse owner at this point to me can do is just be a sponge and learn as much as they can so they can be an active participant in the care of their horse's feet. And certainly with social media and the internet and our ability to exchange information so easily, there's never been a better time for owners to be the advocate for their horse. And that's not to say they should be adversarial or confrontational to their healthcare provider. It just means that the best way to help your horse is to be knowledgeable and be a team. So that way, any problems that come up, any questions that arise can be handled with the horse's team for the best outcome. So learn, educate yourself, don't be afraid to ask questions, and work with people who have similar priorities about the horse's feet, people that attend their own continuing education that will take the time to answer your questions and really are an active participant in advocating for the care and well-being of your horse's feet because that's their job. And if they're not, don't be satisfied with that. Go learn and ask questions and you'll have a fabulous outcome. Yeah. And I think just like you were saying about how you got started, I think a lot of us got started because we were, you know, really seeking answers and wanting to you know, yeah. figure out how to help better and do more. So, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it, it's knowledge is, is only beneficial and yes, we have to be discerning. There's a lot of, you know, things out there that either don't apply or you have to be able to sift through what's valuable and relevant and what isn't, but you know, the more communication, the more knowledge, in my opinion, the better. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being willing to, you know, answer all these questions and, and talk a little bit about what you do and how you help yeah. horses. It's been really cool. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I, it's a pleasure to chat with you and I'm always available if anyone has questions or has a problem that's unusual or even ordinary, you know, I'm, I just love to help people and help horses. So thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Of course. Great to talk to you, Alicia. Talk to you soon. Yeah, you too. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye. This is Patrice Sager. I am a hoof care provider. I've been doing hoof care for 15 years, AHA certified and PHCP certified, and a mentor for PHCP presently. And I've known Daisy, I've known of Daisy for 13 years. I've known her personally for 10, somewhere around 10, and have grown over those 13 years to highly appreciate her and love her as a friend. She is one of those people that is a friend to all. She really truly has a friendly spirit. But as a hoof care provider, my opinion of her is that she really wants to do what's right for the horse and get down to the meat of it. She's a no-nonsense, no fooling around. 
We're going to make things happen. We're going to help these horses. Um, we're going to find out what's going on. We're going to get to the bottom of it. And she, that's her goal. And she provides her expertise to the hoof industry. And I believe she's qualified, highly qualified to do that. I have learned a lot from her. I never, ever go away from being around her or with her and not improve my own skills as a hoof care provider. So that's been valuable to me to be able to have that privilege of, of her sharing and willing to share. And she's got a lot to give and a lot to offer in that brain of hers. <laughs> um, she and I, really have become closely associated in our hoof care world with the introduction of my uh, a supplement formula I came out with a year ago, year and a half ago about. And she was one of my first uh, people to try, first uh, rehab centers to try it. And we've made some interesting discoveries along the way uh, with what we, the changes we saw. Uh, with Kiss Trace and in the horses. some She would call me up and all excited with things that she noticed were improving on horse on horses with my supplement. And then I would call her with the same excitement. Uh, you know, yeah, we've had, we've had a great time together growing in our knowledge uh, through the years. So uh, I'm actually very appreciative of all that she offers. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person, and chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too, so we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.